Okay, welcome to the production possibilities model number four. Just a few things. Remember, it's all about the economizing problem. Unlimited wants and limited resources. It's all about this kind of fact that not everything is good at doing everything else. This land's good at vegetables. This land's good at grapes. This is what the basis of all economics is, not just for this production possibilities model. And now this particular thing is all about detailing the economizing problem, detailing unlimited wants and limited resources, and you end up really with this model right here. Grapes, veggies, and all these people over here, and what are they going to do with their resources, and how are they going to divvy them up, and what are they going to make, and how is their life going to be, and how do they make a decision about how many grapes to grow, and how many veggies to grow. And that means they have to make a decision about where to be on this production possibilities curve. And that's part of what microeconomics and macroeconomics and the debate's all about. How are these people going to decide? It comes down to two choices. Let's put them up here. You could have a committee. You get a group of people. They look at the grape veggies problem. They know their particular land structure. They decide as a group. They say, maybe these three people here get together. They have all the power. And they say, we will make this much grapes. And therefore, with the remaining resources, we will make this much veggie. And they pronounce with this star here. We'll make it uh, a star. They say, we will produce at star. And then everybody else does exactly what they're told, and that's that. Well, that's good enough, except what happens if these people love their wine? They don't like veggies so much. They want more wine, but the committee is telling them, no, no, you must eat your veggies. Is this a good place to be? No. It's all about efficiency. The first task of any system is to somehow have optimal efficiencies. This is what econ is all about. How do we get efficient production, efficient allocation of resources? So let's change the color because that becomes very, very important for economics efficiencies. This is our first look at something that all economics, right through graduate school, right through all the big math problems, look at is how do we achieve efficiency. Anywhere on this production possibilities curve is production efficient, meaning we're using all of our resources and they're being used the least costly way and we're producing some combination of grapes and vegetables that's using all... If you're inside here, like at a point like this, we'll put a heart there, that's not production efficient. You could be producing more of both things, but you're not. You're not using all of your land. It's like this part of the land just goes fallow. Nobody uses it. Well, that's not smart. These people want at least something, some more. So inside here is not production efficient. The second thing you're trying to get at is allocation efficiency. That's number two. One, production efficiency two, which means where on this curve do you want to be? Where is this group of people want to go and produce? How do you decide allocation efficiency? That becomes an extremely complex question to answer, especially if you're in a committee. If you're in a committee trying to figure out what people want, imagine the difficulties. Well, for economists, especially Adam Smith, when we start to look at supply and demand, we end up seeing exactly what it's all about. Why a free market can help us decide allocation efficiency. In the future, you're going to draw something like this, a demand curve and a supply curve. You're going to see that the supply curve represents costs and the demand curve represents benefits. And you're going to notice that when you have a free market, things don't get produced way over here where costs are greater than benefits. 
and things don't be stopped produced here where benefits are greater than cost, they end up being produced right here where the benefit equals the cost. This is critically important because it turns out in a free market where the benefit equals the cost, you get a production number. If this is for grapes, for example, you would get a production number. And in this case, if these people all went to the market, demanded a certain amount of grapes, you would come up with a certain market equilibrium. Let's say that market equilibrium is 8,000. These people go to the market, demand 8,000 pounds worth of grape get produced into wine, and the land starts to grow with grapes, and you use up land to grow grapes, and you end up with 8,000 grapes, and you end up with fewer veggies, let's say 6,000 veggies, you end up with this situation of 8,000 grapes. This is the market choice for allocative efficiency. Look at this. Look at this battle between somebody controlling where allocation efficiency should be and a free market controlling where allocation efficiency should be. Here are the people. They have a way to organize their society. Are they going to have free markets do it or are they going to have committees and governments do it? This sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's a big battle for macroeconomics. It's where the root of microeconomics comes from. We can produce allocative efficiency without authorities. Adam Smith says freedom of individuals, freedom of enterprise. And lo and behold, when you have these freedoms, wow, you get perfect allocation efficiency here. That's the argument. Of course, you might say, maybe this committee knows better. Maybe this committee has a forward-thinking idea about what's going to happen in the future. And if you grow more veggies, your laborers become stronger over here, and your production possibilities become greater. And what would that mean? So here's this super smart committee. They know something you don't know. They know that if you eat your veggies, you become strong, you become smarter, everything. You can work the land better. So over here, this land becomes more productive because you're not drunk sitting at home doing nothing, for example. So this land becomes more productive. Or you're smarter and you can invent new ideas and new things. And the committee says, hang in there. Eat your veggies and look what's going to happen. In the future, we'll be able to produce more. And if you're able to produce more, the production possibilities curve shifts out to the right like this. With the same amount of resources, you can make more. As a matter of fact, you can end up at a spot like this. Gosh, I wish I had another color. Let's just make it white here for the second. You could end up at a spot like this. Why is that so important? Because look what happens there. You make more grapes and more veggies. Look at that. Well, I guess we could put it like that. More grapes and more veggies. And now the committee says, aha, see, do what we say and the world will be a better place. Hey, man, I can't tell you which way is the right way. It's an almost impossible problem to solve or think about. But you got to learn how this works because this is what economics is all about. Learn about supply and demand. Learn about monopolies, pure competition. Learn about macroeconomics and you'll be much better able to understand this particular debate in the world and you'll be much more comfortable living in a society I think when you understand it. Anyway I could go on and on but I better stop. That's production possibilities curve. Maybe I'll add one more just about points on and off the curve and basic things that will probably be in your textbook whatever textbook you have. But really for me this is the most important thing. Alright see you later. Bye.